Next, we're going to turn our attention to more serious fungal diseases. The most common fungal infections that cause systemic or body-wide disease in humans are histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, and coccidiomycosis. All three are examples of dimorphic fungi growing as a mold in the laboratory and as a yeast in the human body. What is unique about these three fungal diseases is that they characteristically inhabit a unique geographic area of the United States, and hence are called endemic mycoses. Histoplasmosis and blastomycosis are commonly found in the drainage area of the Mississippi River Valley, but isolated cases of both diseases may occur in other parts of the country. Coccidiomycosis is unique to the southwestern United States, including Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern California. Well, now is a good time to return to our opening story of the camping scouts from Wisconsin summer. Eventually, several children were diagnosed with blastomycosis. A large epidemiological investigation was undertaken trying to locate the source for this mold. Was it randomly found in Wisconsin backyards, or was there a more common source? This is when the de detective epidemiologists went to work. They obtained clues that linked the children to summer scouting activities. This raised the suspicion that the fungal infection may have been acquired when they were close to where they were staying. Several scout groups were interviewed in an attempt to locate the source of the blastomycosis, and it was deduced that the most likely exposure locale was the beaver pond where the ecology was taught. The closer and more frequently the children were to the beaver pond, the more likely they were to become ill, and the more likely the illness was actually to be serious. 65% of the children with disease remember picking up objects from the ground, hence creating a small dust cloud that was likely inhaled. Now, the relationship of beavers to an outbreak of blastomycosis had not previously been described. Environmental features such as the chemistry of the soil, air humidity conditions, and the presence of beaver excrement likely combined in the right formula to allow blastomycosis to flourish. More generally, all three endemic mycoses have one of three clinical presentations. You might be surprised to know that the majority of cases are asymptomatic, or at worst, a mild respiratory infection that generally does not get reported or even come to medical attention. When a more significant load of fungal spores are inhaled, this will lead to a pneumonia similar to our blastomycosis scout cases. Usually with a normal immune system, the body will recover without specific antifungal therapy. However, now that antifungal therapy is more readily available, these pneumonias can be treated and resolved sooner with medications. On rare occasions, these fungal diseases can spread outside the lung, throughout the body, including the brain, liver, and the spleen, and the disease is labeled as disseminated. Another true case example I would like to show you is how the pervasiveness of fungal infections can extend beyond the scope of a Boy Scout troop. A massive outbreak of fungal disease occurred in Indianapolis several decades ago. Nearly 40% of young adults and 9% of persons older than 55 who lived in certain parts of Indianapolis was presumed to be infected on the basis of serological or blood test data. This represented nearly 100,000 individuals. The outbreak was also unusually severe. There were 15 deaths and 46 cases of progressive disseminated histoplasmosis. Patients presented little by little over the course of four months with symptoms of a dry cough, coughing up blood, chest pain, fever, and body aches. They presented to different physicians' offices, and it took several months before the scope of the outbreak was known. Sound familiar? 
Surprisingly, in spite of a large epidemiologic investigation, no exact common source outbreak location was identified. Histoplasmosis was, however, cultured from all over Indianapolis. Cases appear to have clustered near the center of the city along the White River and Fall Creek that ran through Indianapolis. An old amusement park close to the center of the outbreak and demolition activities for a new tennis stadium were strongly suspected as the exact source of the fungus. Now, histoplasmosis outbreaks are otherwise notorious for occurring after other common exposures, such as cleaning a chicken coop, clearing a bird roost, demolishing an old building, or cave exploration where bat guano is abundant. The mold especially likes to live in the soil where bird or bat droppings provide extra nutrients to support its growth. One of the bigger lessons learned from the Indianapolis outbreak was the capacity to inflict a large incidence of disease in a major metropolitan area, a harbinger of our concerns of bioterrorism. There are many other fungal infections of clinical importance. Cryptococcus neoformans is a yeast that is found in the soil throughout the United States. And when inhaled by patients with compromised immune systems, can lead to pneumonia and serious infection around the brain or spinal cord, known as fungal meningitis. Cryptococcus has a very thick walled sugar based capsule, which prevents white blood cells from attacking and destroying the yeast. Hence, aggressive antifungal therapy is required to successfully treat this dangerous and often life threatening condition. And while we're talking about meningitis, our discussion of fungal disease would not be complete without discussing the 2012 outbreak of fungal infections of the central nervous system. A multi-state outbreak of fungal meningitis and infectious arthritis was detected in the eastern United States in September of 2012. Over 700 patients who received steroid injections produced by a single pharmaceutical compounding center developed meningitis or spinal infections. And more than 30 patients who received injection into the joints, like knees, developed the same infections. Exerio hylum species, a brown-black fungus, was the cause. The injections were being given for pain, since steroids reduce inflammation and pain shutting down the body's immune response at the site of the injection. Now, 18 days was the average time from the injection to the beginning of symptoms. Further epidemiologic investigation revealed the risk of infection was associated with specific batches of the steroid and older vials of the steroid. And, and naturally, the more injections the individual received, the larger the volume of the steroids, and the greater the risk of infection. Now, the Tennessee Department of Health sounded the alarm based on a telephone call from an alert clinician treating a patient with this unusual form of fungal meningitis. With information rapidly communicated from Tennessee, the Centers for Disease Control reached out to state and local health officials and took collective action. Within days, the source of the outbreak was identified and a massive effort was undertaken to identify and contact nearly 14,000 potentially exposed patients and their physicians across 23 states. Voriconazole, an antifungal medicine, was used to treat most patients, but some were treated with a more special, dangerous antifungal medicine, amphotericin B. Since amphotericin does not distinguish well between ergosterol and cholesterol in cell membranes, serious side effects such as kidney failure occurred. Unfortunately, there were many deaths and many patients left with long-term disabilities from this tragic outbreak. Moving forward, let's talk a little about our normal environment. Now, you might be surprised to know that in spite of the, quote, clean air 
in our home, outside, there are actually thousands of fungal mold spores that are floating around, invisible in the air. Normally, our immune system is sufficiently strong that occasional spores that land in our lungs do not cause infections. In patients with compromised immune systems, these spores can enter the lung and cause an established fungal infection of the lung. Aspergillus is the most common mold to cause infection in immune-compromised patients. This is a significant problem with transplant recipients as up to 5% of transplant patients may die from invasive fungal infections when this aspergillus is inhaled into the lung and the immune system cannot compensate. Now, what would happen even with a normal immune system if the air was filled with a large number of fungal mold spores? Would we get sick? Well, some individuals may manifest non-life-threatening yet annoying allergic symptoms from mold, similar to hay fever allergies. Those already with allergies might notice the allergies being noticeably more severe. Sometimes concerns are raised regarding mold overgrowth in building, producing, quote, toxins that cause, quote, sick building syndrome, or mold illness in the home environment from toxins. Well, a full discussion of these conditions is a bit beyond the scope of this course, but the term toxic mold is not really a clinical disease entity. The actual mold is usually not directly toxic, and by and large, having your household duct system routinely cleaned is probably an unnecessary expense. However, allergy sufferers may find this individually useful for them. Let's talk a little bit about antifungal drugs. We've developed a variety of antifungal medications to treat various fungal conditions. Some of these medications are topical. Many of you will remember using gentian violet, which caused you to turn purple for the treatment of ringworm. This is rarely used today, as other topical medications are usually effective for superficial fungal infections. However, treatment of fungal nail infections still presents an extreme challenge. There's only a 5 or 10% rate of long-term success, so gentian violet is still used for this condition. The prototype antifungal medications are known as azole drugs. They interrupt the cell wall synthesis in fungi, blocking ergosterol production and leading to the incomplete synthesis of the cell wall. Since fungi do not replicate as quickly as bacteria and they have a slower growth rate of metabolism, antifungal therapy needs to be continued for longer than antibiotics. Now, two other antifungal drugs used for systemic infections include the echinocandin medications and amphotericin. Echinocandins disrupt the cross-linking of the fungal cell wall, and amphotericin directly attacks the fungal cell wall, leading to alterations in the permeability of the cell wall and subsequent fungal cell death. Well, in concluding our fungal lecture, I need to tell you the beginning of a sad tale. It seems that humans may not be the only victims of fungal infection. White nose bat syndrome is an emerging fungal disease of hibernating bats that started in the northeastern United States and is spreading rapidly into the central United States. So far, it has affected seven bat species. Since this syndrome was recognized in 2007, millions of insect-eating bats in at least 22 states and five Canadian provinces have died. The infestation gets its name from a white fungus, Pseudogymnoactus destructans, that affects the muzzle, the wings, and ears of hibernating bats. This behavior of infected bats usually results in alterations in their mannerisms as well. Why should we care about bats? The economic effect 
on the insect suppression by bats to U.S. agriculture is valued in billions of dollars per year, and the true ecological consequences are not yet known. Bats are major consumers of insects, and an increase in these pests could result in damage to crops and forests and lead to a need for increased pesticide applications. Bats also play crucial roles in plant pollination, seed dissemination, and cave ecosystems. Bat guano is often the basis of the cave's food chain among animal and plant species. And it's estimated that there have been a loss of almost 80% of the bat population in the northeastern United States since the white nose syndrome appeared. This sudden and widespread mortality is unprecedented. And in spite of efforts to contain the disease, it unfortunately continues to spread without a cure in sight. Finally, let's turn to the effect of fungal diseases on plants and how they are currently affecting our lives. And I'm not talking about potato blight. How closely are you paying attention to the price of your cup of coffee? In 2014, a fungus nearly destroyed the coffee bean known as Arabica in Central America. Leaf rust is a fungus that chokes the coffee plants as they grow. The fungus seems to have a predilection for the Arabica coffee bean, which accounts for 75 to 80 percent of the world's coffee production. Now, why is this occurring? It appears that a slightly higher temperatures in Central America have allowed the fungus to thrive at higher altitudes where this coffee bean grows best. Starbucks has even bought a Costa Rican farm to research the devastation of this coffee pathogen. Get out your wallets. Your coffee habits just got a lot more expensive. So today you've seen that fungi have devastated crops and affected animals and humans in various ways. In our next lecture, we'll introduce you to some of the people who have de helped us develop infectious disease tools to identify different microorganisms and help in our efforts to control them. See you next time.